Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Daphna Ishorvitz. I'm the founder of Walk Talk International, and welcome to the uh, fifth event of We Care, We Talk, a Curators in Conversation, a, a program created by Tel Aviv, by CCA Tel Aviv Yafa, in collaboration with uh, Walk Talk. So before I hand over the uh, stage to Tamar Margalit and uh, to our esteemed guest, Alison uh, Gingeres, uh, I just wanted to remind you that this is a 30 minutes uh, conversation format. You may uh, send your question in the chat in the bottom and we will uh, open the uh, mic after 30 minutes. If you have any questions to uh, Alison and uh, Tamar, uh, you are uh, welcome. So Tamar, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thanks everyone for tuning in. And I'm so pleased to have with me this evening, Alison Gingeres. Um, Alison is an independent curator and writer. She was formerly a curator at the Centre Pompidou in Paris, at the Guggenheim Museum in New York, at Palazzo Grassi in Venice. Um, and she's currently an adjunct curator at Dallas Contemporary. Um, and she uh, is someone that since the beginning when Nicola and I started this series of conversations, we both knew that we had to have Alison on as a guest. Uh, she brings a totally refreshing and unique perspective um, to our practice, to the curatorial field, as someone who is has the deep respect and knowledge of art history, but also is consistently thinking of ways to shake it up um, <laughs> and how to do that. And is has been very successful at doing it and has curated one of the, some of the more, uh, more impactful exhibitions in my view. Um, so I'll jump right in um, and start, let's do a share screen. <clears throat> um, okay, great. And do play. Okay. So I want to start with one of the first exhibitions that you co-curated, Alison, um, at Saint Pompidou, and then it, it's a traveling exhibition, Dear Painter, Paint Me, um, the, painting the figure after Francis Picabia. And it's a show that surveyed figurative painting from the 1940s all the way to contemporary painting and included artists such as Picabia, Sigmar Polka, Alex Katz, Martin Kippenberger, Kai Althoff, Elizabeth Payton, John Curran, Neil Rauch, and many more. Um, and this exhibition really set the stage for um, your deep um, and long-term engagement with painting um, and figuration in particular. And as a medium, you know, we can certainly um, think of painting as kind of the most celebrated art form and certainly the most seeped in history. But also, you know, from a um, vantage point of contemporary art, it's in a way the most shunned medium um, and, um, you know, in a way that um, it's often thought of as kind of anti-avant-garde. And I'm curious, Alison, um, about why you think it's gotten such a bad reputation. <laughs> and, uh, what, what it is about painting and figurative painting in particular that keeps um, drawing, that keeps um, making you want to come back to it, to re-examine it uh, and to redeem it. Um, well, thank you so much, Tamar, and to everyone for um, inviting me here today. It's really a privilege and an honor to um, participate. And um, I guess it's important to go back to the context in which this exhibition was made, because I think the art world and certainly the art market has changed so much. And um, at the time when this project was percolating for me. I was already thinking about it in the late 90s. Um, in New York, I was um, a PhD student at Columbia. I was a student of Benjamin Buclo, who would have been horrified by this subject. <laughs> right. And I think I always had this kind of antagonistic um, sort of imperative that drove my interest from a very intuitive but early perspective. And I was seeing that there were a handful of artists who at the time were starting to get attention like John Curran, but it was very much against the grain, as you were saying about the kind of contemporary scene. 
you know, this was like the height of institutional critique. This was the height of a lot of kind of conceptual and post-conceptual practices. And figurative painting had no currency. You know, it was not uh, something that you walked into every gallery in New York City and saw. Um, so I was sort of interested in uh, when I arrived at the Pompidou and I was given an opportunity to develop my first exhibition on my own, I I kind of wanted to create a genealogy for figurative painters who knowingly kind of were sticking their finger in taboos, like that specifically making figurative paintings that were accessible, but politically considered retrograde for various reasons. Um, were like laying the groundwork for then the new crop of artists who were emerging in the you know mid to late 90s who were the kind of contemporary ones featured in the show and i kind of came up with this structure where i was going to choose one artist starting with late picabia um for each decade to kind of lay the groundwork of the art history of why at certain moments in those decades it was like an antagonistic gesture to draw upon this um, this language of art making that was at the same time very legitimate and ancient, but did not feel at those different moments to be vital or at the cutting edge of um, the art practices. So uh, Picabia certainly was in you know wartime making these um, paintings that we later discovered were made from photographs of these kind of cheesecake um, erotic uh, images of women that were very important for contemporary artists who were painting in the 80s and 90s, but who art historians always looked at as being highly suspicious. And then Bernard Buffet, who in Paris was like pouring salt in the wound because he somehow was an embarrassing artist for the French, but to me was such a fascinating figure that in the aftermath of um, the war in the 50s was painting this sort of misery of of life and, and reconstruction of everyday life. So I was sort of like creating this structure and then I had the, the task of sort of picking, cherry picking artists that I felt were taking up this mantle of figuration in provocative ways. And, you know, the artist you have up right now is Kurt Cowper, who was mm -hmm. making these Cary Grant nude portraits um, in the early 2000s, the late, 90s that were really shocking and and yet like their execution couldn't be more traditional it looks like a Norman Rockwell you know so I I, I was really interested in that um, push and pull of um, the artists who even like you know to to embrace and to learn like a traditional means of painting was so transgressive at the time um, yeah. and so it was shocking for people but then what's what's changed since then is that you know painting has again become like a lingua franca for many artists and certainly the market has monetized and capitalized on it so the, it's it's a very different moment now to make uh this kind of inquiry than it was in 2002 right but the whole the, i think the kind of the market angle or the um in a way, you know, thinking of painting as complicit in the art market um, has brought about another kind of taboo that's now right. um, with its own kind of, um, that with painting now being so popular um, and, you know, fetching these super high prices that again, there's the taboo of, uh, if we talk about kind of what's considered to be avant-garde or the persona of the avant-garde artist, that surely it can't be someone who, um, is receiving these high prices at auction or his, you know, kind of this whole, um, that whole aspect of it. Totally. I mean, like here we have Martin Kippenberger and the painting of the two figures from behind is from his Dear Painter series, which is how I took the title for the show, in which he basically delegated, he hired a professional sign painter to make the series, which is again, like this provocation and this knowing antagonism of you know, de-skilling or outsourcing painting, which in 1980, when he was making these works was, you know, kind of uncharted territory. And yet, and no one wanted these works, you know, they were, you couldn't give them away. And of course, now um, the auction houses, uh, years later, have 
you know, manage to create um, some kind of desire and legitimacy for these these practices. But I was really interested at the time in that that power and that transgression, which has has definitely changed. But I guess the question is, like, is it still valuable, even though this shift has happened? I mean, I, I think so. Yes. But right. Um, context is very important, right? Yes, definitely. And this is a great um, bridge to the next um, exhibition that I want to bring up, which is really one of the, your most recent, uh, but still on this topic. Um, so it's um, Pictures Girls Make, Portraitures, um, and it's a show that was shown at Blum and Poe Gallery in Los Angeles. Um, and it, it again takes up this idea of figuration and particularly portraiture, but through the lens of feminism. Um, yes, and, and I think the feminism is also not just gender based. It's sort of like a humanist feminism that um, embraces um, all aspects of human experience. So it's not an identity politics specific feminism. I mean, um, I should maybe preface by saying this title is actually a quip that was attributed to Willem de Kooning, who was speaking about his wife, Elaine de Kooning, that her you know, portraiture was just pictures girls make. And he was so dismissive because of course, in the 50s and 60s, when ab you know abstract expressionism was at its height and its power, um, portraiture seemed so irrelevant. And Elaine de Kooning even spoke of the fact that she went down that narrow um, alleyway because it was the only place where a woman artist could actually have some breathing room because the men weren't interested in it. And I wanted to sort of take that dismissal and, and turn it into a rallying cry to both um, highlight how women artists going back to the 16th century um, made pictures and made self-representations to assert their legitimacy as artists. So here you have in the foreground a, a recreation of a Sofonisba Angusola self-portrait from the 1550s made by a contemporary artist on a found object. Um, and then the opening room had a, a mixture from the 19th century till today of self-portraits of, of artists, not only women, but artists of color, artists from different countries, queer artists. And I was interested in, in a way of like um, an act of penance that my first show on the subject was so white and so male. And I think there were like two or three women only in the show and it was extremely Eurocentric. And I was interested in sort of making this argument that portraiture, which has this incredible art historical longevity, has always been a vehicle for um, diversity and empathy. You know, we connect to portraiture when you go to an old master or an old mistress gallery, right? And you have these um, ability to connect to the stories of those sitters or those artists. And I was sort of interested in trying to bring together a, a large array of artists from different periods and from different experiences and and point out commonalities and specificities and the fact that the genre of portraiture has this primacy um so that was kind of what the show was dealing with yeah i'll just mention a few of the artists who were included um really spanning from the early 19th century to today leonor finney elaine de kooning maria anto benny edwards beaufort delaney joan brown um also zoya Cherkasky. Um, yes who people here, of course, are familiar with. Um, so it's such a fascinating also context to think about, you know, particularly her practice. Um, and you came up with kind of mini um, subject, kind of um, sub subjects, right? Underneath portraiture. I'm, I'm curious. Kind yeah, of so there were like different genres of portraiture. Like I mentioned, the, the question of self-representation was yes. the largest gallery and Zoya was in that. Um, that uh, that room and she created a self portrait um, of her painting in her studio. Um, I showed her all these art historical um, examples going back and there was one portrait I think I showed her from um, the period of the French Revolution and it was a sort of obscure artist but uh, it was a woman painting in her studio and there was a baby like her, her child positioned right next to her easel which was like an incredible image to me. 
and Zoya made like the 21st century version of it for our show. Oh, wow. um, and uh, the earliest portrait in the show was a turn of the 18th century artist called Joshua Johnson, who was the first known um, Black American artist, professional artist. And he was um, in the portrait business and he made portraits in Baltimore, uh, mostly of white um, subjects, but Baltimore was a very progressive city and had like a whole center of abolitionism. So I wanted to create different genealogies, but also there were group portraits. There were um, sort of social portraiture coming out of, let's say, Alice Neal as an important, and Mela Mutter, who uh, to me has been a, a great sort of rabbit hole of art history that I've gone down. Um, I don't know if your audiences would know her work, but she was a uh, also considered the first Polish Jewish professional artist who left Warsaw, had a practice from the early 20th century in Paris and Montparnasse, and she died in Paris. And her practice was so based in this kind of social portraiture where she would seek out working class people, um, uh, you know, uh, women, uh, people on the street, and they, those were her subjects. So this was also like a very transgressive and inclusive humanistic approach to the genre, which was really important to me. So actually, she takes up us directly into our next kind of the topic I want to bring up. Um, and here I'm showing the an installation view of the first room of um, My Name is Marianne, the exhibition that you curated here at the Tel Aviv Museum. And it sort of uh, brings up another major preoccupation um, of yours, which is your interest in Polish post-war art. Um, and over the past, correct me if I'm wrong, 20 years or so, you've been splitting your time um, between New York and Poland. Your partner is Polish, you've learned the language, um, and you have kind of a deep fascination with especially kind of marginalized or overlooked figures in Polish post-war art and particularly also Jewish Polish artists. Um, so here, just to refresh, and I'm sure people have seen the exhibition, the superb exhibition um, in Tel Aviv of Marianne. And I'd ask, I want to frame it um, in a larger context, also side by side with another exhibition that people probably are less familiar with that you curated um, recently, here of Erna Rosenstein, another figure um, who was, I think, 14, 15 years um, Marianne's senior from Poland, yes. who stayed in Poland after the war. Um, and here I'm just showing a few examples. But you've spoken about the fact that both of these artists um, in different day, in different ways defied preconceived ideas um, of Polish post-war art or Polish post-war history at large on the one hand and what Jewish art is um, on the other. And I'm curious if you can speak about maybe both of these artists, um, Marianne and Erna Rosenstein and kind of parsing out their differences and what they meant to you, how you came about to showing them. Sure. Um, so as you mentioned, I spend a lot of time in Poland. And uh, I first encountered Erna Rosenstein's work through a book that was published in Polish um, some years ago. And uh, even though Erna, as you mentioned, stayed in Poland after the war and uh, was really part of the establishment of the avant-garde, um, because she was uh, before the war associated with the Krakow group, which was a real minority um, around Tadeusz Kantor. And they embraced a kind of surrealist um, set of practices, which were very taboo in Poland. And also her own personal history was so compelling to me because she was a communist before the war. She um, was a young radical. Her, she came from a very um, bourgeois family. Her father was a judge. Um, she was extremely well educated and um, she had seen the Surrealist exhibition in Paris before the war and the Degenerate Art Show in Berlin before the war broke out. Um, and she stayed in Poland because of her commitment to um, communist ideals. 
And yet she completely ran against the grain of the establishment. So even in the Stalinist period, she continued to make surrealist figurative art that was not allowed essentially. So she was blacklisted. So her whole life, um, she, um, she had this independence and yet um, she also was among, and this is where the kind of connection between Marion and, and um, Erna is so fascinating, is that they both are amongst the first artists who survived the Holocaust and were making art that represented to some degree their experiences. Um, and uh, Erna's story is very different than Marion. She um, survived in hiding, although she witnessed her parents' murder while they were trying to escape um, the ghetto in Lviv. Uh, she was a poet and um, was very vocal throughout her life in Poland as a, as a survivor. She stayed in Poland after 1968 when there was a purge of um, Polish Jews who, um, even though they were communists, they were forced to leave the country. So I, I just became absolutely immersed in this history. And then later, like a few years after I had already been working on Erna for like five years, um, I was asked to get involved in this Marion project. And again, I went sort of deep into his story, which in many ways is, is different than Erna, but he was completely unknown and continues to be quite unknown in his birth country. So to me, I don't know, like, I guess I, I'm very driven by um, a, a revisionist art history where I feel these artists need to be reinserted into the canon, reinserted into the conversation, both internationally and in Poland. And, um, you know, this work is ongoing, actually. <laughs> uh, the museum Pauline in Warsaw is working on a show uh, in 2025 and they had no idea about Marion until I gave them the book about six months ago and now they're going to include him in this exhibition so it'll be the first time that his work will be you know integrated into a larger narrative of the continuity of Jewish life in Poland after the war and I hope that it'll spark further interest and you know i don't know it's a, it's a real vocation just like i hope that one day we can do something with erna in israel because um some of her surviving family lives in israel and um her son recently passed away so like i i feel this vocation to continue this education and this um you know these are really complex artists who don't fit into a neat box um and um, that's something that I'm always attracted to. I guess it's like kind of the common denominator of what I'm interested in. <laughs> yeah. This is wonderful, Alison. Um, Thank you. Super interesting. And I think, you know, people, for me, it was really revelatory, the Marianne exhibition. Um, so I'm sure others will feel the same. And I know we're, um, a little short on time. So I want to just mention a future exhibition um, that will, that maybe we want to give just a, a short um, teaser for, which you'll be curating in Venice. Um, so it's the artist Eddie Martinez, um, and he will be, and you will be curating the San Marino Pavilion. And can you just maybe speak a little about what we can expect there? Sure. Um, Eddie is completely like a different uh, kettle of fish, uh, but he too is a bit of a, you know, he's like, he's not an outsider artist, but he's largely self-taught. Um, his work oscillates between abstraction and figuration. Um, so the pavilion will, in, drawing is really at the heart of his practice. And he, I, I came across his work when I did a big exhibition that was sort of rereading the Cobra movement, um, which was a radical leftist post-war movement, Copenhagen, Brussels, Amsterdam. And his um, his work like almost intuitively replicates a lot of the interests of the Cobra group. And so I was uh, I got to know him through that. And then uh, the show in Venice will incorporate a large table like full of the drawings that he uses to generate the paintings and then some small sculptures that are 
cast bronze uh, assemblages he makes from found objects. So it'll it'll have the like a kind of experience of being immersed in his aesthetic and conceptual universe. And um, I hope if anyone's coming um, to see your show in Venice and to they'll stop by and see it. Terrific. Thank you so much, Alison. You're welcome. Yeah. Should we hand it over, Daphna? Are there any questions? Mm -hmm. We can't I'm hear mute. you. I was on mute, so now I'm unmute. Yeah. Uh, you can maybe take off the, uh, we can view the. Um... Thank you. Okay, we'll view side by side so we see everyone. Oh, yes. The recap of all of oh. the. Just a second, I can't do stop share. Hang on, sorry about this. Okay. Okay. Okay, so everyone is here. <laughs> so um, I think it's a good time if uh, anyone has a question can do maybe an unmute and um, ask. Mm -hmm. I have one question that I, anyone have before I, if, uh, Anybody? So I will maybe ask one question. Alison, that I'm kind of interested is, um, how do you actually perceive uh, or think about the, uh, the power that curators have on uh, shaping artists' career? I mean, listen to you, <clears throat> to what you are doing and, um, a little bit about your thoughts about that, about this power of curators. Um, it's a complicated question. Uh, I think that when I was coming of age as a curator, it was like the beginning of these rock star, what they used to call airport curators in the 90s, where um, like Hans Ulrich Obrist, um, maybe he's like the poster boy for this model, where it was really about his authorship and his... Um, role as this kind of globe-trotting discoverer of artists. And well, certainly that's impacted in, um, in a positive way, the globalization of art and, and all of that. I guess um, over the years, I've become more invested in um, history and bringing like, even when I'm working with a very young artist to bring like context and discourse, like to make it less about the curator as impresario, whereas more like the curator who scaffolds meaning around artists work, whether it's a living artist or a, a, a deceased artist. And um, I also think that like I'm more and more interested in the curator's role in expanding the canon mm -hmm. um, because I think that, you know, certainly I had the privilege of moving from a very like um, specific type of canon, going to the Whitney program, going to Columbia, studying with all these people from October Magazine, which had a very specific and impactful role in shaping art history, and then moving to Europe and having to like question everything, like, you know, to, to be in a departmental meeting in which all of the things that I took for granted as being like important and that, you know, what was the post-war were completely not the, the common belief. So I, myself, that kind of spurred in me this desire to like question everything. And um, even when I started to sort of work from a more conscientious, like feminist perspective, um, I also immediately wanted to kind of interrogate the received ideas of, well, these were the important artists, like feminism is Judy Chicago and the dinner party and all this kind of second wave feminism. And I was more interested in like, well, who was left out? Mm -hmm. You know, and so I think that's always my question. It's like, who's been left out and why? And then creating the, the, the scaffold or the narrative or the historical kind of understanding of reconstructing um that and that that's kind of always what gets me out of bed i guess yeah thank you so much wow where is that <clears throat> anyone else but, um i'll put uh, on view I again want, i want to ask a question if 
possible. Hi, thank you. Hi, uh, thank you, Alison, for this uh, presentation. Uh, it was really interesting. I wanted to ask when you start um, to conceive of a of a show of an artist that is less known, how do you get the material from where do you start to gather like what because I guess it's also uh, your role to like put uh, their their own history in context if they're not known so it's kind of um, important which works you show and which works are left in the studio yeah I mean it it's it varies from artist to artist but maybe to talk about Marion, for instance, um, when I was first working on the show, I um, tried to get my hands on like anything published on on his work. And I always like make this joke that I grew up watching Scooby-Doo, which was like about solving the mystery. And so I always feel like I'm doing the Scooby-Doo like investigation. And it starts probably in the printed record. But then I started to like bit by bit, I would phone call by phone call, I would find like who knew him. And uh, I was doing a lot of oral histories and you just keep, you know, digging and digging and digging. And artists like Marion were really challenging because in the beginning I had no idea, like had he made a hundred paintings, you know? And yeah. the more I would find, I was like amazed how prolific he was, you know, his, his journey from um, Poland to Israel, to Paris, to New York. And I, I literally think I turned up anyone and everyone who was still alive, who knew him up until like a month before the show opened. I met an Israeli woman who still lived at the Chelsea hotel, who was one of his best friends before he died. And she, all that she told me wound up really impacting the way um, I wrote about his work in the catalog and you know, so it's like reconstructing someone's life and it, you get really deep into it. And it's like, you know, one of the most gratifying things I think one can do in the field. Well, I have a follow-up question, if that's possible. Uh, so if, when when the, the person is passed away, do you have issues with the family? Like if- the, It just the... really depends on the artist. You know, like with Erna Rosenstein, for example, her son, she only had one son. Um, and he was so helpful, you know, like really allowed me to, uh, he lived in the apartment that, um, she worked in and, uh, he, you know, they had incredible, um, records and, and things that I could really get deep into. Um, but then like with Marion, there was a person who inherited a lot from his widow and this person was very, um, not helpful. Uh, and <laughs> shockingly, I would say actually anti-Semitic. So it was very weird that he, this person who held so much of Marion's, you know, material production, uh, did not want me to put anything out there about the Holocaust, which I found completely mind boggling. And I had a very, uh, big conflict with him. Um, but I think we persevered and we tried to stay true to what I think is actually in the work. You know, it wasn't like we were interpreting, you know, we just basically showed, um, his own conflicted relationship with all that he survived. Um, so, you know, it varies like it's, it's every time is a different kind of case. Okay. Thank okay. you. Sure. All right. No more question. So, uh, Tamar, I think, uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, Alison. This was really terrific. And thank, thank you, you everyone for joining. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.